<laughs> all right. All right, we are live, so you guys don't be saying anything about all the people watching. Yeah, don't be, don't be doing anything like that. Yes, sir, baby. Yeah, I know Tanya's trying to get you to all sit on the front and everything like that. Uh, Shannon, if you're watching, I hope you're doing good. Chris, any of you guys that might be watching, to, um, hey, welcome. Uh, hope everything does good. Uh, this is first, the first class for our journey for, for the new year. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have journey, we'll have this journey class, and then we'll, we'll have one. Um, we may actually be able to have one before Thanksgiving, another one, but I doubt it. Usually we start, then we'll have one in like January, and then, uh, February, then uh, March or April before summer, and then we, usually about three a year is about all we can, we can have for some reason. I don't know why that is, cause, but, but that's about it. They last 10 weeks, so, you know, that's about the time frame you're looking at. And if you've noticed in your manuals, you see that there are 10 lessons. Uh, maybe you haven't had time to really look through that, but there, there are 10 lessons in there. And um, so we're going we're gonna to enjoy it. Um, we've got some instructions that I think you, I, I need to mention to you because when you start looking at your lessons, you'll start thinking about what in the world am I supposed to do with this? Every lesson has questions in it. And the questions uh, are really basically to try to help you focus on what the, what the material's about this time. Uh, so that you're in a frame of mind to, to kind of be in the flow of what we're talking about and what, what we're dealing with. There's not a lot of material to read. As, as, as you can see, basically each lesson takes one page in the manual. And so it's just a little bit of information about what we're talking about the scripture passages are, I have the main scripture passages in there for you, don't I? Or do I? Uh, the first page should probably be the passages of scripture that are for, for that particular lesson. And then it, every lesson will have its, its scripture page, so the scriptures are there so you can read them without having to have a lot of trouble with it. Of course, there are always some other scriptures in every lesson that, are not on that scripture sheets. Just kind of the main big scripture for that lesson is on the sheet. And then there are others that are mentioned in some of the notes and so forth. And it will serve you well to read those because obviously they're part of the thought of what, what we're doing in the lessons. Uh, the questions as they come up, you'll see them. Uh, obviously they'll have, some of them will be um, uh, multiple choice. Some of them will be a uh, discussion. Uh, some will be, uh, you know, share your experience about this. Now, what I, what I want you to know is that in class, I might ask some of these questions, like, did anybody, who did this question, you know? And if you feel like you would, wouldn't mind sharing what you wrote, then you can say, oh, hey, I do. And then I can call on you and you can and give us your answer. But now most of them are going to be pers very personal. So don't feel like that you're going to have to share any of this stuff. All right? Because if you, if you feel like you... It, you know, one of the things that I've learned is if you put a camera into a situation, I don't care if where you... You could be on a street corner somewhere, but if there's a camera there and everybody knows that the camera's there, it alters everything about what happens. Nothing really happens that people, they're very, you know, they just don't, don't act normal. You don't get to see the normal. Now, if the camera's hidden and nobody knows it's there, then you get to see the, the real stuff. Or a recorder of any kind. If you have a discussion, man, people will just, if they know it's there, it, it, just, it just alters the way you do. And so don't think, the reason I'm saying this is because I don't want you to think that when you write an answer in your book that you're going to, I'm going to ask you to expose that answer, okay? The only time that I might ask for a volunteer or something like that, most time I'll talk about me. And, and I, that was another thing I want to mention to you, that um, I don't know your experiences uh, a lot. I do know some, but I don't know a lot of them. But I certainly, <laughs> but I certainly don't want to expose anything about anybody else's thoughts or concepts or anything I've observed or anything like that. So 
I'll just use myself because, uh, I mean, obviously all these things have to do with my life, Tanya's life, our life, because uh, as we wrote them, you know, it, it, it comes out. Um, and, and I have answers to every one of these because it, all of these have been a part of my life. And so I don't want you to think that I'm some kind of Mimi bird up here, you know, <laughs> trying to talk about myself all the time. But on some of these things, I, you know, I, can't, I don't really feel comfortable talking about you, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. And then if I ask, and you don't mind sharing, say, hey, yeah, I, I got that pastor, and then you can share whatever you'd like to share about it. But you need to answer those questions because those questions uh, help you get the feel of what it is that this particular lesson is talking about. There will be five, there are five areas that we talk about. Mm -hmm. So it'll be my money, my mouth. I, that's really uh, interesting. You know, the Lord said a lot about how we talk and how we speak and what we say. And it talked about the tongue quite a bit. You know, and it's amazing how what kind of things he did. So we'll have basically the Ten Commandments, the big the the big ten things that the Lord says about your about your mouth, about your money, about your mind. That's where we're starting today, with how we think. Uh, you know, Romans twelve uh, tells us that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. You know, and uh, that we read this morning. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because it's your mind. It, 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 your life comes out of your mind. Who you are comes from your mind. What you do comes from your mind. How you act comes from your mind. Uh, so your mind has everything to do with, with your total life. So your mind, your money, your mouth. I say your marriage simply because I, I, I like the cute alliteration of all M's, you know. But it could, if you're not married, uh, any relationship you have, there, there, it has some rules to it. Uh, if it, especially if it's male, female, uh, no matter whether it's with a boss or, or a neighbor or uh, your girlfriend or your daughter or your son or whoever it might be, your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. If there's a male, female relationship, there, are, there are some real laws to that that really matter a lot. And there are ten of those: five for the women, five for the men. And uh, those are really, I guarantee you, those laws right there, if you have anybody that's having marriage difficulties or relational difficulties, it, it, bring them with you that night, uh, those two nights, because <laughs> it'll really, I'm serious, I, I have done marriage counseling all my life. You know, I've been in the ministry so long, and I've done hundreds of weddings. And every time, I used to spend a lot, a lot of time counseling with people about pre-marriage counseling. And I even developed workbooks. And we'd, we would do workbooks. It would, like I would it'd take about six weeks and I would do a whole workbook and make them work through it with me. And then, and then I had uh, other times where I had uh, basically marriage seminars. You know, we would have, you know, four or five lessons and stuff. Anyway, I've done all kinds of stuff. And you know what I found? None of it does any good. <laughs> because when people get married, it's not like they, when they're dating. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't explain it. I mean, you would think that it would be the same. And people that live together. Seriously, I've had people that have lived together for years. Five years, six years, ten years. And finally, the Lord gets in their heart and they say, we don't need to be living together. We need to be married. And they will get married, and within a month or two, boy, they've fallen out, and they want a divorce and everything. And I'm thinking, you lived together for 10 years. How in the world are you having problems now just being married? Mm -hmm. But the statistics prove, seriously, the statistics prove that people who live together have divorce rates higher than people who don't live together. It's ridiculous. You wonder, why was that? Why is that so? Well... It's when we get married, there just seems to be a different level that comes into our relational life. And, uh, expectations. yeah, expectations and, and just different w ways of, 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 of feeling and understanding. And, and so, anyway, um, the thing about marriage counseling is I found whether I counsel with somebody six months, six days, six minutes, or nothing, 
it didn't really seem to matter once they got married because no matter how much you try to help somebody understand what being married is like, you cannot get them there. I don't know, I don't, the ha, you know, I, I've, we've gone through the stages of marriage, and you guys have probably been in that message. If you hadn't, I'll do it again soon. But, um, but you know, the first stage is the happy honeymoon, you know, and uh, everybody, everybody's happy. I'm great, you're great, we're all great, ain't God, I just, you know. And then, and then the second stage is the party's over, you know, <laughs> which, which is when we begin to discover the person that we're married to is not perfect like we thought. And they begin to discover we're not perfect either. And uh, you have warts and blemishes and all, you know. And, um, and you get this, you know. And, then, and, and so you discover things about each other, you know, that you just didn't really anticipate or know and all of that kind of stuff. And, then, and so that shatters some expectations and some things like that. And then what happens then either decides whether you go on in life as a couple or whether it just falls apart right there. And uh, so no matter how much you try to prepare somebody for what will eventually happen, you, they can't be prepared. It just it won't happen. Uh, you just can't do it. And, yeah, Bill? I've been there, so this is experience. Mm -hmm. But two things happen. One of them is the commitment changes. Right. Commitment changes. That's Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll have to think about it a minute because I've got the other good <laughs> Well, let me go ahead and talk, and then if you remember it, raise your hand. Put your, put your hand down, and then raise it back up. If you re and I'll, 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 I'll say, yeah, put your hand down, and then when you, put, when you remember it, put it up. And, hey, believe me, I understand exactly what you're doing right now. I, everybody in here that's over 50 years old knows what just happened, you know. <laughs> I guarantee you. I guarantee you I can do it in a heartbeat. Where was I, by the way? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so you can't prepare people for all of that, and, um, and it really gets to be uh, here. here uh, holy every, smoke. Every situation is different. Yeah, right. That's good. That's why, like with kids, you can't raise all kids the same way. But yeah. Every child is different. That is every a, relationship is different. That's right, and that's exactly. You cannot have a blueprint. Right. That's exactly what my next point was, actually. So you just really read my mind. Uh, the po point is you can't prepare people for the changes that are going to happen because everything that happens in life is so variable that whatever happens at the moment is what has to be dealt with. So you can't prepare somebody months in advance for something that you don't know is going to happen, and then how it's going to happen is going to change, and they might not even recognize it. You know, you might have spent a week going over a certain thing, and then when it actually happens in real life, they don't even realize that's what it is. So here's what I tell them now. Here's what I tell them. I'll say, all right, here's our, here's our marriage counseling. Uh, keep coming to church. That's my marriage counseling. Keep coming to church. Whatever happens, do not miss church. Because whatever is happening in your life at the moment, God has something to say about it. Yeah. And if you will come to church every Sunday, you know, really you need to come every time the doors are open, but, but you, at least as a minimum, as a minimum, come every Sunday. You come every Sunday, whatever you need at the moment, God will speak to you about it, no matter what the message is about, no matter what the songs are about. Somehow, God will speak to you about what you need at that moment, and when he does, it will affect the way you think and the way you feel, and he will change your mind. He'll transform it, or he'll change your perspective about something, or he'll empower you with some faith to walk on through something that you were about to quit on, or he'll affect the other person that, you know, maybe it's their problem, and he'll change them. He'll speak to their hearts about it and their lives, and, uh, and, 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 and that's it. And so if you'll keep coming to church, uh, you'll have a happy life. If you don't, uh, we'll see you at divorce court, you know. And, uh, and it's, almost that, it's almost that predictable, actually, really, it is. And I don't know, I can't, it's hard to understand how people can be involved in something that affects their life in such a positive way, and then when they get married, they quit. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, good, I can't tell you seriously how many people 
And if some of you are out there watching, I hope you hear this. I can't tell you how many people come to church until they get married. And then when they get married, they quit. And I'm thinking, why do you do that? It's like, okay, I'm going to come because I want the pastor to like me. And then after he marries us, then I don't care, you know. Uh, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, why people do that. But they do it all the time. And I'm thinking, if your life changed so much while you've been coming before you got married, what makes you think that it's not going to affect you the same way after you get married? And if your life was a tangled up, jumbled up mess before you started coming and letting the Lord speak to you, what makes you think if you quit coming, it's not going to go back to that jumbled up mess that you had? And we'll be pulling you up out of some ditch here in about two or three weeks from now, you know, crying about the Lord didn't take care of me. I mean, you know, I mean, come on, man, get real about it. But anyway, there are 10 rules to marriage, and I got off on all that. And then what else? What one, what one am I leaving out? Uh, marriage, money, mouth, and ministry, your ministry. Every one of us have a ministry. Now, don't let the term ministry because, again, I put ministry because I had the cute little, you know, uh, M, M going along here. And so it's ministry, but ministry just simply means what you're called to do and be. And every single one of us are called to be ministers to, of the gospel not just to be a preacher on a stage or a singer or a Sunday school teacher or a youth worker or, or whatever, that there are, that all of us have a ministry. Because believe it or not, and I know this is really scary to think, but every one of us have people in our life that, that, that admire us, that look at us and say, I want to be like them. Or they got it together, you know. Well, maybe not everybody. Yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know I'm kidding now. You know I'm kidding. Don't be get home and think he's serious. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know I am. But um, <laughs> you, are, you definitely are original. There's no doubt about that. But everybody has somebody. And now, I mean, it might be your children. It might be, you know, your neighbor. might be a mate. might be somebody you work with. I mean, they, they look at you and they say, man, I... How do they get that way? I, I wish I could be like that. Or, boy, that's so smart, or they're so capable. How do they get that? You know. So those are the people that you can have influence over, the people that admire you and want to be like you. And, and so we all have the responsibility, according to the Scripture, to be the kind of person that moves them toward Christ. And it doesn't mean you can make a decision for somebody else. I wish I, we could. If we could, everybody would be saved because, you know, I know everybody I know, I want them to come to the Lord. So if I could make it so, I would make it so. But we don't have that power. We, all we can do is present, and, and then they have the choice as to what they do with that and so forth. And so you just have to live for Christ, and, and these principles that you'll learn will help you know what's expected of you and how you are actually to accomplish that in your life, how, how you can be the minister that God called you to be in your life, no matter what it might be. Uh, most, I mean, most people are not going to be you know, preachers in a pulpit or singers or workers in a certain area of church, but you all have a responsibility to be ministers for Christ. So those are the five areas. And then there will be 10 uh, rules or 10 words from the Scripture, the 10 biggest things according to my perception and thoughts about it after all these years. Uh, I've chosen the top 10 big things about each of these five areas to share with you uh, to help you grasp what's, what's there from the Lord so that we can, we can become everything that God created us to become. And so uh, that'll be what we look at. So we'll look at five each time. We'll have ten classes, and we'll look at five of these lessons each time. And, and so when you go home to do your, your work at home, you'll have five lessons. And tonight, I'm going to start with the first five. Now, you're not going to have... You know, obviously, the opportunity to go home and answer questions and then come back with them. So we'll just kind of go through the first five tonight uh, of your mind, 
and then next week you'll start with the second lesson on the mind and then you'll be responsible for the next five lessons and you'll see it you know it'll say let lesson one lesson two lesson three and, it, and it'll go like that so when you go home you just work through there now let me encourage you to do this let me encourage you not to just hurriedly come in 15 minutes before class and say he might ask me something tonight about these questions so I need to get them answered and you just hurriedly just go through them and just try to you know <laughs> jot down feverishly some kind of thought about that but that you that you have time to reflect on it because that's that's really what it's all about I mean it's not this is not intended to be busy work you know I mean I don't want you to do this because I think you have to suffer some you know to love the Lord uh, I think, you know, it, it's not intended to be that. It's intended to really actually help you reflect on what it is that, that we're talking about in this point. Because, you know, there are a lot of areas that you can just kind of go out in one direction or go out in the other, or you can kind of get lost stumbling around in here about what it's talking about and what you need to do. Because, like I said, there's only one page here of information, so it's not like you have a lot of information that you're going to have to sift through to know what we're dealing with. And it's kind of, it's kind of sketchy at times because, you know, it's just, that's why you come to class. So I can expound on this and we can, we can see everything about it. And I'm going to tell you something. If you've ever been in here before, I know Lawrence and Belle have been. Have any of you others ever been to this class, this particular journey I class? Started it, but I think you've been in everything. It and then I think, I think you've been in everything. Really, but it's all right. It it's a, well, it's all right. You, you just keep on, baby. Keep on. You're brilliant. You know you are. <laughs> but anyway, Bev and Lawrence have been in every one of them, and I think they could testify of this. It doesn't. You could come to. You, we could have this one again uh, ten weeks from now, and you could come right back to it, and it wouldn't be the same. Yeah. It's it's amazing how it happens. I'm serious. It's just so amazing because whatever the group that is here needs, it just seems that that kind of is the way it it. It goes with the Lord. Y'all know I can fall off the cliff and, <laughs> and come back up and move around that way and go that way. You know, that's one of the things about a lot of time with the Lord and a lot of, a lot of time in the Word. You can just kind of fall off and go out that rabbit and after that rabbit and come back and try to get this one. And um, so it doesn't matter if you chase rabbits just so you catch them. You know, it's kind of my thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. We got to come back and catch him, don't we? Put him back in the cage. But, uh, but you know, it's, a, it's funny because a lot of times it's the, it's the rabbit that people need, you know, and uh, that's the way of God remaining anonymous, I think. You know, it's kind of like coincidence. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. And um, so anyway, that's how the Lord gets a lot of things to us, I think, uh, uh, in spite of what is planned, he, he somehow pulls it out. So anyway, that's what we're going to do. And uh, if you have any questions about that, just you know, let me know. And you can write. Obviously, that, that manual is yours. So you can write in there. You can put an extra sheet in there if you want to put that and put your answers on the extra sheet or however you want to do it because I'm not going to ask for this back and I'm not going to come look at it. You know, and say, uh-oh, wait a minute, you didn't answer that question, did you? Uh, yeah, we don't have a test. We don't have a test at the end or anything like that, you know. But remember, the Lord's going to hold you responsible for everything that you, you should hear, whether you hear or not. Say, ah, well, I gave you a chance to hear that. You should have been listening, you know, to it. But anyway, so, uh, so here we are with the laws of, of, of the mind. You know, Madison Avenue has... Uh, come out with a slogan, and I can't remember. I tried to remember this afternoon as I was looking over the material. The first time I heard the little phrase, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Um, I don't know actually when that came out, uh, it's, uh, it's, but I can't remember. It's been a long time ago, but, but that is a really great word. And I'm going to tell you, just like I was saying this morning about uh, the Marines stole the slogan, a few good men from God. I think Madison Avenue got from God, a mind is a terrible thing to waste because, because it is. Because my mind has everything to do with who I am and what I do and where I'm going in life. You know, um, isn't it Proverbs, uh, I think it's Proverbs 23 that says, um, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Yeah. 
Okay. You know, yeah. right. That's exactly right. Yeah, that is exactly right. If your mind, it, you know, when, when the scripture talks about your heart, it's really talking about your mind, really. I mean, we, you know, the heart is an expression of uh, the real me, the inner me, you know. So when the scripture talks about as a man so thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, we don't really think with our heart. We really think with our mind. But the expression is that it's from deep within us. It's, a, it, it, it's our totality of being. It's, it's really our soul. You know, I, I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. The soul could be described as the place of intellect, the place of emotion, the place of personality, the place of expression. My soul, you're listening with your soul right now. Your soul is receiving. It's my soul that makes choices in my life. When, when I give my heart to the Lord, I'm really giving my, my soul is saying I surrender. I wave the white flag, you know. And so as the, the scripture makes it very clear that the way I think and the, it affects everything to do with my, with, with, with my life and, and what I do. So uh, it's very important what happens with our mind. Now, with that thought in mind, let me just read, and you can turn to your passage the first page in your manual, if you turn it back one, and up at the top, you'll see the scripture passage. It says Philippians 2, and it says 1 through 5, even though it really means 1 through 11, okay? <laughs> All right. It says 1 through 5, but it really means 1 through 11. And if you look, if you look at the scriptures, they're numbered, so you can tell. Let me, let me just read this to you because, you know, we just went through this in Philippians, uh, in our study in Philippians. A, a couple of messages are about this, and this is about, you know, the message, how to reduce conflict would be the message that dealt with this passage of scripture uh, in Philippians that we deal with on Sunday morning. But let me, just, let me just read this passage. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy, and he's going to, then now he's going to say, by doing these four things, okay, these are four things that are really important, by being like-minded, which means that we all believe the same things, so as, as a group of believers, it's important that we believe the same things. Now, I know that if I brought up certain topics here tonight, and I said, what do you believe about those topics? You might express some thought about that topic that I might say, well, I don't know about that. Yeah. And I might preach about something, and you would say, no, I'm not real sure about that, but I love Pastor, and I believe he's a man of God, so I'm going to go with that. I'm gonna... But, you know, so we know there are little intricacies of things that we might have variations of thought on. There are lots of little gray areas in, in theology. You know, I used to get all bent out of shape over that. Seriously, I, of course, when I was young, I'm like a fighter. You know, I mean, I'm... I'm trying to convince everybody I'm right. And, and so, yeah, oh man, y'all would not believe. You could ask Tanya. I mean, I was like, I was like, oh, uh, you, I was so, so strict and rigid. Seriously, I was so, so, if you were, if you didn't believe like I believed and I was teaching, man, you just would be, have a hard time being around me because I was so, uh, you know, so strict on every single thing. And I, I really didn't see any gray areas. I just saw black and white, you know. But it's over the years the Lord has softened me to the point where I see, I mean, there's a lot of gray. There are a lot of things that, that we don't exactly, totally, 100%. But, but as an overall, it's important that we believe the same things. And Paul said it in another way. It's not only important that you speak the same thing, but that you believe the same thing. So here he's saying, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, that you would believe the same thing. Having the same love, which is self-explanatory, that we would all have the same love for one another. Being of one accord, which means we're of the same spirit. 
that our spirit is alike, that, that, we, uh, that, we're, we're, that we're all together, together, you know? I mean, we, we have that same heart for each other. We have the same passion for each other. We have the same spirit that drives us and that we would be, you know, considered like a singular body and that we'd be of one accord, which means we all believe we have the same purpose. That God is not, we're not split up and divided over, okay, this is what God wants us to do. And nobody says, no, 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 we need to do this. And it's like, no, 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 wait, 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 we need to do. Because you see that all the time. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this. But because I've, you know, I mean, I'm a professional religion person uh, in actuality, you know. <laughs> My business is religion and uh and I've studied it, and I see it, and I'm around people that are in it, and, you know, all my friends used to be pastors and so forth when I was, you know, just in just doing ministry and wasn't doing anything else, working or whatever. But So I would hear it, and I would be around it all the time. I don't know if you know this or if you're aware of this, but churches have different ministries that God calls them to do, and God puts people in those churches designed to fulfill that ministry and that purpose. Like some churches are, uh, let's just call them, I'm going to call them soul winning churches, which means that their main focus is to try to get people saved and come to the Lord. And if you go in there, everything that that church is about is about that. I guarantee you, when you walk in the front door, it's almost like the person at the door shakes your hand and say, hey, brother, we're glad you're here today. Are you, are you saved? You know the Lord. If you die right now, are you going to heaven when you die? But how do you know you're going to heaven? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Certainly not. We're all called to, to be soul winners. We're all called to try to win people to the Lord. That's not the point. The point is... Scare me away. Yeah, you probably would. You know why? Because you're not called to that. That's not your church. You know? See? And you wouldn't feel comfortable in that environment because all of a sudden you would begin to say after about four or five weeks, now you might like the passion at first and you might like the... Conviction, yeah, I know I need to try to win people. And you feeling all guilty about the fact that you don't walk around with a card in your hand always saying, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Are you? And you feel guilty because you think you're backslidden because you don't do that all the time. And then every time you go to church, you just keep hearing the same thing over and over and over and over. And then you begin to think, man, what happens after you come to the Lord? We don't ever hear anything about that. All we hear is, are you saved? And do you know Jesus? And will you come to the Lord? Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's because that's not your church. That church's purpose is that. That's why God calls people with that same heart and passion to that church. And then some people, some churches are praying churches. I mean, everything you hear about is pray this and pray this. And they have prayer groups and they have people that come and they have all night prayer meetings and they have all these things and intercessory circles. And they, you know, you hear the messages are all about praying for people and prayer changes things and prayer. And so they, the whole focus is kind of about that. And the people that are there, are in that same heart and that same spirit and same mind. Not that we all ought not pray. Y'all know I'm not saying that, that all this is bad. I'm just saying that you can see this. And then some people are all about discipleship, about growing people up in the Lord. And they have Bible studies and they have classes. And everything you hear is about how far you've grown in the Lord and what you need to know and how you teach. And, man, everything is like a school. And, and the messages are about that and all that kind of stuff. And then some churches are about passion. And that's what you hear from the pulpit. And when you go in there, you know, it, it, the messages might start in different places, but they all end up being about the same thing, you know. You need a passion for the Lord. And, that. and, and so what I'm saying to you is that churches have a purpose. So the people that are called to a church are called because that's God's purpose for them. And the people that are called to the purpose of our church, you're here because that's your heart and that's your purpose. And so it's important, Paul said, that we all have the same mind, which means the same purpose. We all agree that this is our purpose and our passion is focused this way and that this is the direction we should go. 
you get somebody in here who has another passion and they're going to get disgruntled and they're going to say, man, I don't ever hear anything about soul winning up in here. Y'all ain't right with God. Y'all to be about that. And then somebody says, no, man, prayer is the thing we need to focus on. Man, we don't ever hear any message about prayer. We don't. No, man, it's getting growing up in Jesus, you know, and, that, and you get all this division going, see, and that we, you're not of the same mind. You're all split and splintered out here and you got this faction and that faction and that faction and that faction and now you're not a, you're, you're not a body you're a disjointed entity up here. So, so the mind, see, as I think in my heart, so am I. And all I'm just trying to say to you is that the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And if you want to change your life, you have to change your mind. You remember the passage from Romans? It said, let this mind be in you. No, it says, it says and don't be conformed to this world uh, uh, let's see, what, what, how did it start? It started with uh, uh, our reasonable service. What, what was that? It says, uh, oh, I can't. Uh, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present yourself a living sacrifice, totally and acceptable to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And, and don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do we get changed? Uh, we work on it a lot. We, uh, we study manuals. We, uh, we try to do better. We go to counselors. No, the way we change is God renews our mind. Our mind gets changed, and then our mind changes us. So in these lessons on the mind, all of these lessons have to do with what God will do to change our mind and how our mind needs to think in order to please God and to grow up in our lives. So with those thoughts in mind, the first law that God, the first thing we talk about is the most important thing. All right, I put this one first because in my opinion, I think, that this is really the most important thing in life, and, and that is the law of a servant. I think the most important thing about my mind first is to understand that God has called me to be a servant. And the reason why it's important is because if I don't have the mind of a servant, then everything in life becomes about me. Uh, Jesus Christ came and went to a cross. Let me, let me continue with Philippians because it, it goes on to say, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in low, lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but also the interest of others. Now, it doesn't say you don't look out after any of your interest. It just says don't just think about your interest, but think about what happens to others. Let this mind in, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind was that? who being in the form of God didn't consider it a thing to be grasped for or to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What, what kind of mind did Jesus have? Jesus had the mind of a servant. Can I, can yeah. I ask, and you can correct mm -hmm. me if you want. All right. Because there's people that are like, oh, well, you attract a lot of different kinds of people. Like, how can you be friends with somebody like that? And because to me, when I read stories about who the people that Jesus attracted and the people that he was, right. you know, that he healed, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of uh, prostitutes and drug addicts and stuff like that were, that were just attracted because sure. his personality right. and his non-judgmental mindset. Right. I mean, for me anyways, that's what I get when, yep. I, when I think about it. Like that's, for me, maybe that's why I attract people because I'm not looking at you like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're wearing that today. Did you <laughs> sure. see? Did you hear what she did last night? Because yeah. I'm just there and people like, 
even shy people will come up to me after a couple of weeks and be like, so this is going on? And uh -huh. I'm like, uh, they begin to talk to you about it. Well, yeah, because every, people understand. I mean, when people look at you and you look at others, you, you can judge within just a few seconds, really, about how you're being looked at. I mean, you, you can tell whether this person is, is basically looking at you with some judgment in their life or some criticism in their heart or whether they're compassionate, whether... They, they are listening and they know you and, and, and they understand, okay, everybody's not perfect and we're going through all this together, so what is it that's happening? And let me see if I can be of some kind of help to you. You know, you experience that. Well, all that comes from your mind and how you've received things and how your mind co considers things. See, Jesus, the, the, this verse in Philippians is saying, if you want to be like Jesus, then your mind has to understand that life is not about you. Life is like Jesus went to a cross and gave himself on a cross. Why? Because it wasn't about him, right? It, it wasn't, and he gave his life and he laid down everything for somebody else. And so the greatest consideration and the greatest understanding that I can have in my mind is life is not all about me. Life is about about how I can sacrifice for others, how I can present for others. And what this does is it changes everything in our life because all of a sudden, life is not about what we think is right or what we think we like best or what or the way we like to see things or experience things. I, I give you an example, and this is just an example. Let's just say our church... Of course, obviously, we all know that it's different from a lot of other churches. And if you don't believe it, just go to one. I mean, you know, I invite you. Don't go all at one time because I'll miss you. But, I mean, just kind of kind of spread it out, you know, kind of spread it out. Like one or two of you every Sunday go, you know, don't all of you at one time. But but um, thank you, Lord. That's a good word. That's God saying amen. But uh, anyway... Uh, go, just go, and, and, and you can see. I guarantee you, you can walk in. You don't, have to, you don't have to be there forever to know what you're seeing and feeling about it. But our church is, is different. And like I said, I don't want you to think that we're different because we think we need to be different. Yeah. Seriously. I mean, I'm old. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not some young, uh, naive, inexperienced, Pollyanna life is, you know, all ahead of me kind of person. I'm almost 62 years old, and I've been in it a long time. So I'm not like, you know, uh, some newcomer who's got this idealistic thought that I can do everything and change everybody, you know, kind of deal. But what I, what I have noticed and what I am saying to you is that um, our church is different because of what God has called us to be. And, and so because of that, we reach people who God knows needs that kind of ministry to them. And so we're the way we are, not because we want to be the way we are. We're the way we are because that's what God has called us to be. So we adjust whatever we want or whatever we think to, to, to reach others that are in needful of this. And, and an example, our music, you know, our music doesn't match me. I'm an old person. So that means I attract old people. Believe it or not. Easy now. Uh, <laughs> easy, big fella. Uh, all right, let me just say it this way. Birds of a feather flock together. And what, ha what that means is, look, when, when I was young, seriously, and I'm going to just describe this, and this is, another, this is one of those things where you need to understand I'm, I'm using me as an example because I know what happened to me. If I knew this happened to you, I would use you, but I don't know what happened to you. But as uh, I've been in the ministry uh, since I was 18 years old, so you do the math. I pastored my first church when I was 18 years old. I was ordained when I was 18 years old. And, uh, and February the 29th, 1976, so that gives you an idea of how long I've been in the ministry. So when I was young, I pastored churches, and it they filled up with young people. I pastored a church for 14 years that grew from like 39 people to 800 people. Of course, the FBI couldn't find half of them, but they were still on the roll. 
They may, have, they may have been looking for some of them. I don't know. But, but still, they were there, and, and it was about that many people, and we just grew and grew and grew and grew. And when, when I first went there, there uh, Justin was five and Amy was four, and, uh, and we had uh, two people in the church, two, two five-year-olds or two five and one and five and one four. That was it. By the time we grew all these numbers and so forth, that four and five-year-old class was like 45 or so. And every time they moved up to the next level, it just blew up the Sunday school, you know, and you had to have three classes for the first graders, three for then when they moved to the second, three or four for the second grade. And they just did that. And by the time they got to be youth, we had to have three youth directors for all these ages. And I'm just saying to you, I was young. My children were young. People were young children, loved me. They identified with me. They liked me. And that church filled up with people like that. And, and so everything we did matched with that, you know. But now I'm 62 years old almost. So young, people with young children and all that, they don't just automatically identify with me. Older people that are like my age, you know, kind of, they just kind of gravitate and they say, you know, I like him. He's like me and all that kind of stuff. And then our music comes along and it's totally young. Our, our music is totally not about me, you know, not about stuff that goes with me, but just about, I mean, it, it just, it doesn't match what, uh, you know, people would come in, and if they see me, they would think, okay, hymns and, you know, old school and church and, you know, that kind of thing. But our music says young and vibrant and, and edgy and different and stuff like that. Why do we do that? Because God's called us for a purpose, and it's not about me. If I had my way, I might like something different. I might like Southern gospel. I might like, I like spirit. You know, I might like hymns. But it's not about me. It's about what God's called us to. And so we do, we do what we do because that's what we need to do to fulfill the purpose God's called us to. If it was all about us, we might do something else because that's what we prefer. So Jesus, as an example of a servant, means... He did what he did because of what God sent him to do. Because life is not all about him. Life was all about what he was sent to do. And he understood that his purpose was to be a servant to other people. So what I'm saying to us is the first and greatest law of our mind is that we would have the mind of Christ who did not think being equal to God was something to be grasped after or something to take advantage of. Yeah. But, but in lowliness of mind, he submitted himself to the cross because that was his purpose. That was God's purpose for his life. And if he had rebelled on that, there would have been no cross. There would have been no death for somebody else. It would have been about only what he wanted, not what God wanted. So for us, the mind of Christ, uh, it's, it's, not about, it's not about me. It, it's about him. So the first law of your mind is the law of a servant. And in your family, you're a servant. In your church, you're a servant. In your life, you're a servant. It's what, it, what, what, do, what can I do to serve others, to affect others in life? What does God want me to do to be effective in my life because life's not all about me. All right, second law, the law of generations. The law of generations says that you did not just pop out of thin air. You came into this earth. <laughs> yeah, you came into this earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you, came, you came in <laughs> into this earth. <laughs> uh, with a, with a heritage, uh, uh, we have genetics, we have uh, we have temperaments, we have family lineage. Uh, this is saying that you're affected by this, whether the inheritance, whether the family lineage, whether the traditions of your life are good or bad. Regardless of of where you are, you are affected by what has happened in the generations. Of your family. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, just to show you a, a verse about generations and, and kind of what, what we're talking about, 
in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. You can read it when you go home tonight. Just start the first verse and go all the way down through about halfway through the chapter or so. And it's the Ten Commandments. And he says, you know, you, here's what you do. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Uh, you're to have no graven images. You're not to worship anything that is on this earth. You're to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, you're not supposed to lie about your neighbor, cheat on people, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the earth. Uh, don't covet the things which are your neighbors and so forth. And then at the end, he said, you know, if that I, you're, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity, which is the twisting. Iniquity is a specific word for sin. It means to twist or to distort. So when you see the word iniquity, it means that your life has been twisted or distorted. I'll give you an example of what that means. When I was pastoring the first church I ever pastored, is a little single room about about this big right here, about that big, and it had a, uh, one of those Dearborn space heaters, you know, those ones that were about that tall and about that wide and about that thick, you remember? And they were in the little cabinet, and they had the grates out here and the gas. Well, if, in case you don't remember, uh, the top of that thing would get hot. And so you had to be careful that you didn't set something on top of that that, that was plastic or whatever, because it did get hot over a period of time. And I remember we used to back up. We had one heater in our whole house I grew up in. And believe me, you could feel the wind blowing through some of the cracks and corners and stuff. Nothing was square and plumb and everything else like that. But, but the point being that I'd back up to it sometimes when I was young. And, you know, you have your little pajama bottoms with something on. And then they'd get red, get hot. And then if you, if you happen to pull against the leg, boy, that'd burn you up. You remember some of that? Well, we had one of those kind of heaters in our church, and it was real cold. And so the, on Saturday night, I went and, and lit the heater uh, and put it on low so that in the morning when we got ready for church, it wouldn't be just freezing cold in there. Only had, we didn't have any central heat, just had that one little spot heater in the church right, in, right over by the wall in the sanctuary. And it had some plastic flowers on top of it. Well, I, I didn't think about that. Well, in the morning when we came to church, man, it, it, what, those weren't plastic flowers. It was a blob of melted junk laying there. All right, that's what iniquity is. Iniquity is to take something that had a form or a shape and to twist it out of shape. So that's what the devil does with our life. That's what he says, visiting the iniquity, visiting the misshaping and the misforming of your life. So that's what the devil does. He distorts us so it can't be recognized anymore. So it doesn't look like it used to do, and it doesn't meet the need that it used to have. So he says, this, if, you, if you do this, what God's going to do, if you, if, you don't, if you have graven images, if you worship things that aren't God, if you lie, if you cheat, if you kill people, you steal, you covet stuff, God is going to visit the iniquity of your fathers unto the, unto the third generation. So what he's saying is that sin, iniquity, malformance can be passed down from lineage to lineage to lineage. Three generations. Your grandparents did something, had attitudes, had, uh, had, had shaping of thoughts, had prejudices. Now, and by prejudices, when I say that, and you'll hear me say this every time because I think I need to every time because people have gotten so myopic about the word prejudice. They think just racial stuff. But we have all kinds of prejudice that don't have anything to do with racial stuff. Prejudice just means my mind is already made up about it. No matter how it looks, I mean, prejudice, I could be prejudiced towards certain foods as an example. I could say, I'm never going to eat that. That's nasty. Have you ever tried it? Well, no, but I mean, Daddy didn't like it. So Daddy passed down a prejudice, something that I feel a certain way even though I don't have any experience with it. Or I hate Chicago. It's a bad place. Well, have you ever been to Chicago? No, but Mama didn't like it. Well, Mama passed down her prejudice to you that you don't. And so, see, prejudice limits us. So there are a lot of family traditions that pass down things like this that control the way we are right now. Certain thought patterns, certain behavior patterns, certain addictions, 
certain mindsets, you know, uh, get passed down. I grew up with my dad. He's an alcoholic. So all I ever knew was that life is filled with somebody who's out of control because some substance has controlled their life. You know, they smoked all their life, man. I mean, it was a chain smoker. So when I come along, I'm, you know, that's normal for me. And, and, and you know, so I accept that and I become, okay, well, it's all right for me to be like that. Well, now I've, I've received a generational curse and then my children are going to receive it unless it's broken off of me because it's been passed down from my lineage to my lineage to my lineage. And so if, if I'm going to go to the next level in life, these generational things are going to have to be broken. Somebody's got to break the curse is what this is talking about. Now, also on the flip side, and I don't want to neglect this, there are some good generational things. Some of you have received good generational blessings. Your parents were people of character, so you were impacted by being a person of your word. Dad, mom, man, if they said it, they did it. And so now you are apt to be the same kind of person. My, my dad and my mom were hard workers. I mean, they were always working to make life better. Well, that got passed on to you too. So not only do bad generational things happen to you, but, but you've been blessed with also good generational things. And so in, in, in dealing with your mind, uh, what he's saying to us is recognize that you did not come into this world out of nothing. And what you came out of has an effect on what you are right now. So if you came out of a bad generational lineage, then those things need to be broken off of you. And that to break these things off of you, Christ has to do this. Because it's a spiritual issue. And be ye transformed by what? By reading a magazine? By getting some counsel from your preacher? No, by the renewing, which means what? What does renew mean? It means your mind was new at one time, and now it's old, so it needs to be renewed. Yeah, renewed by the Spirit of Christ. See, it, it might not have been nude by the Spirit of God in the first place, but it, it needs to be changed by the Spirit of God, which is a spiritual deal. It means I pray and I give my mind over to the Lord and I say, Lord, as a matter of fact, uh, we, in, in the lesson, I think Tanya wrote for you um, that you need to, uh, that, yeah, here it is, right at the bottom of the page. Now let's ask God for deliverance from the strongholds in your life. Pray the following prayer aloud. So here's something that you would do to begin to break these things. Uh, thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that cleanses me from sin and sets me free from the generational curses that make me vulnerable to the enemy, to my enemy. Please forgive me for my attitudes and my actions and the wrong attitudes and actions of my parents and grandparents. I now claim freedom from whatever you need to say there and be specific. And I bind the enemy in Jesus' name and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I'm empowered to live in victory. Amen. Yep. To pray that these generational issues might be broken off of you so that the mind of Christ can break through to you and you can become a different person because your mind is not focused and controlled now by those generational curses that have been handed down from generation to generation, but that the mind of Christ would break through and that you could be clean and free. And it's a spiritual deal. It's a spiritual issue. And nobody else can do it for you. It's not something somebody can just teach you. You have to submit to this. And I'm not saying it's magic because we all know magic's not. There's no such thing as magic. We, we were watching something the other day. It's so funny. All the grandchildren were there. I know what it was. America's Got Talent. Y'all ever watch that? I've seen it about three times in my life, and one time was the other night. And um, they had magicians on there. And, man, those cats are unbelievable. What they do is unbelievable. And how they do it, man, I have no idea. But it looks so magical. 
really. It's like stuff disappears and reappears and stuff lights on fire and stuff, you know, changes. Man, one guy, he just moved his hands like this right down over his face and all of a sudden one of his eyes was white like a, you know, like a demon or something looking out. He didn't even touch himself. He just went like that right there and that eye turned white. And I, how did he do that? <laughs> I don't know. And the grandchildren are looking like, oh, man. And they're thinking, man, he's magic. I said, there's no such thing as magic. There is no such thing as magic. It's an illusion. It, it's, they're called illusionists because what they do is make you think it's magic. And you can't figure out how it got done, and that's the craft of it. That's what makes them special is they can do things without you knowing how they did it. But there's no magic. Yeah, it's a sleight of hand. It's, it's illusional. It's, uh, you know, if you see the, the, the trick behind the trick, you, you'll see, man, that's phenomenal. And people have to be gifted and excellent and everything else. But that, it's just a trick. You know, uh, David Copperfield cannot make an elephant disappear. <laughs> no matter what you think, it's not, that's not real. That's not magic. That's an illusion, you know. But anyway, the point being, point being that, uh, you know, you... you uh, have issues in your life that you have to pray and, and, and receive from the Holy Spirit the power to change in your life. It has to be broken off of you. And nobody else can do it for you. You must do it for yourself. Okay? And then thank God for the good things that happen in your life because there are some great generational blessings. You know, some of you have been passed on great things. You know, I, I think, to give you an idea, uh, of course, I came, my family lineage, my, my dad was an alcoholic. I was all of his life until the last, uh, about the last 15, 20 years, my dad was an alcoholic. Got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until he was either drunk or hung over all the time, couldn't keep a job. Uh, you know, that's what my dad became. And I came to the Lord when I was 16 years old. I was the first one in my family, the only one in my family at the time. Didn't even know a Christian, didn't have any Christian friends or anything. I came to the Lord when I was 16 years old, and, uh, and he changed my life. And I never, I, I didn't become an alcoholic. I didn't become a, a, a drug addict. Why? I mean, that was my generational lineage. Because my dad was an alcoholic. All his brothers were alcoholic. His dad was alcoholic. You know how my grandfather died? He was drunk sitting in a porch swing. One of my cousins was pushing him. The swing flipped over, and he was so drunk, he broke his neck right there on the porch. That, that, that was my grandfather. You know how all my, my brother's own, uh, brothers died? They either died from disease, from alcohol, or car wrecks because they were drunk driving. Well, that was my generation. That was my lineage. What happened? Why am I not an alcoholic? Why, why am I not like that? Because Christ changed my life. That generation was broken. So now we have a whole new generation on the tree. The tree went up like this of my family and my lineage, and all the little limbs stopped right out here because death got this one, alcohol got this one, death got alcohol, death, and it all went like that, boop. And then there was one little branch out here that started growing out, and that's us. That's, that's the generation. And now and then, and then I had two children, and they began to grow like this, and then one of them has six children, and they begin to grow like this, and one has two children, and they begin to grow. So when you look at my tree, all of a sudden you got this stump sticking up with four branches out here that have no flowers, and then you have all this over here that's like a whole other tree. Why? Because Christ broke the generation of curses of that off of our life. And that's what I'm, I'm just saying, that it has to stop somewhere. Why can't it stop with you? Right. How do you explain poverty, though? Uh, in, nations that, that don't seem to be able to change, you know, and their children are... Right, where, where whole, whole people are impoverished, like they grow up in poverty, they stay in poverty, they live in poverty. Well, this is not uh, something that it's is a generational thing. This is the this is the land which you live in, like in the in the promised land. When when the Lord sent the children of Israel into the promised land, He said, "All right, I've got ten cities for you to capture and for you to break free." Well, those ten cities were held in 
bondage or captivity based on the leadership of that land and what that land had been subjected to. So as the Lord went in, he, he would break the bondage of those areas, the mindsets, the captivities, the strongholds uh, that are set over a whole area. You know, ev- areas of, of the country have certain strongholds that are over them that are bind- that are that are almost like uh, spiritual entities that are set up in order to keep the people impoverished or to keep them blind or to keep them uh, sick or crippled. You know, certain areas of our country mm-hmm. right now in the land of prosperity and so forth, you can go to areas of this country where the whole town is like everybody, about half of them have cancer or sick and all this other kind of stuff, and they live right, and right down the road is another neighborhood that seems to be totally different from that and blessed. And there's strongholds over certain areas. And I know this kind of sounds spooky and, and then kind of, you know, out there, but the Scripture says that there are spiritual entities that we war against and we fight against, and they're the, the, you know, in Ephesians, we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may withstand the enemy, and in the day of evil, that we might win and put on the whole armor of God, put on the head, uh, put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God in your hand, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and take the shield of faith with which you can quench the dark. In other words, he's describing a spiritual battle, a battle with something we can't see, but something that we have to pray against, that we have to. Uh, encounter in spiritual ways, if we could see what's going on around us right now, it would be so shocking to see the spiritual battles that are going on around us. And according to the scripture, if Christ didn't give us empowerment, we would not be able to stand against this because the enemy is trying to destroy us and destroy our life and hold us in bondage. And so one of the reasons why we should rejoice and be grateful and have a spirit of gratitude is that God let us be born in the greatest country in the world, the country that had freedom, the country that has the right and the privilege to study the Word and to know God and to become something. You know, if we're born in some of these backwards, backwoods, mindset, frame of reference, kind of goofy places in the world, we're going to be in bondage not because we're that way, but because the land we live in is that way. And it doesn't offer. And so the, be, to be thankful and to be grateful for the fact that God has blessed us in this land is one of the mindsets. You know, thank you, Lord, that I'm born here and I can become anything. But that's, that's what you see, Miss Jackie. It's just, a, and, and so that's why we send missionaries, and that's why we try to influence others to, to have more freedom and to be free and to not, not have bondage over your people and, and ha- that they would have an opportunity to become what God's created them to become. So anyway, uh, does that answer you? Kind of answer? Okay. All right, number three, the law number three, the law of tolerance. Are y'all Okay. Okay, okay. We just got a few more minutes. Okay, I just want y'all to know. <laughs> I can get kind of long-winded again. Oh, no, I don't mind that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, y'all don't believe that. All right. Law number three, the law of tolerance. Uh, tolerance could be defined as an allowable deviation uh, from the standard. Everything has a standard. How many of you have ever worked with tools, hand tools, uh, saws, drills, uh, lathes, anything like that? Well, I, I, okay, some of you have. All right, if you read the instruction manuals on all your tools, you would find some specifications on it. And in those specifications, it would have a little frame of reference called tolerance. And it would say the tolerance is plus or minus and it would give you a number. And what that's saying is, when you use this tool, don't expect this to be perfect because there's going to be a deviation of plus or minus this much. I learned this, not because I'm such a great craftsman or toolsman, believe me. You know, I've worked with a few, and I do know a few things, but a lot of things I don't know. But I did have one advantage. I don't even know if they have it anymore. We in, In the seventh grade... I had a class called Industrial Arts. Everybody had to take Industrial Arts. 
And industrial arts was shop. That's what it basically boiled down to. And in there, we had uh, two semesters. And in one semester, we had to do something with leather and, and then something with plastic. And then the next semester, we had to do something with wood and with metal. So over the year, we worked with leather, plastic, wood, and metal. And we had to use the tools by which you work with each of those. And each of those have different types of tools. Well, when we were working with the lathe, wood, we had to glue together about six or eight pieces of like one-by-one one boards, glue them together, and then after, you know, they, after it got cured and everything, then we had to take that, put it on a lathe, get that thing spinning, and then we had to take the little tool, you know, and put our finger up there and then barely touch it and chips would fly off and then you'd go a little deeper, deeper, deeper until it became round. And then you had to come to the end and, and, and hull out the bowl and stuff, and then you had to stain it and do, all right, all right. And you had to work with wood, with metal. You had to use a drill press, and you had to put rivets in a little handle, and you made like a little, uh, a little uh, uh, trash. Uh, what am I looking at? Um, the name has popped out of my mind. Uh, uh, where you sweep it up on it. Uh, a dustpan, 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 yeah. Had, that had, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it had the little, it had the, had the curved metal, you know, frame so you could hold it up here and it was curved. So you had to learn how to bend the metal and you had to drill through and you had to put rivets in it and you had to build the pan out of sheet metal and turn up the edges and turn up, you know, and, and, and all that. So you had to do all that kind of stuff and leather, you know, you had to punch it and you had to do the looping and all that kind of stuff. So we learned how to do that. Well, on every one of those instruments, when you had to drill a hole, it told you that the tolerance of this machine, when you drill a hole with this machine, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to either be this much more than is perfect or this much less than is perfect. So you have to know the tolerance so that when, if you're drilling it specifically for a certain rivet or a certain size something, you've got to know if the tolerance is going to be allowable so you can get that piece to, to plug through there. So you have to know the deviation from the standard. Now, the law of tolerance says that everything in life is not going to be perfect. So you're going to have to allow for imperfection. By this, I'm talking about the people that you are with and that you love. They are not going to be perfect in, in, in life and everything. And, and the way you look at this is you basically say, uh, am I perfect? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think so. So you have to allow for them to not be perfect. I, look, let me tell you, Tanya and I have been married 40 years. And, and you heard me say this, on August the 5th this year, We've been married for 40 years. Let me tell you something that Tanya has learned after 40 years of life. She, she's married to an imperfect person. Well, yeah. She probably knew it before then, Brian. <laughs> probably knew it when we were dating. I've told, I've told her, I said, look, I, I've told her, yeah, I've told her, Lord, listen, and I'm serious about this. Uh, when Tanya stands before the Lord one day, and he says, uh, let, me show you, let me show you these things about your life, and some of them might not be the greatest, it's going to be because of me. Uh, she was the most holy, wonderful, great person that I've ever seen, and still is. And anything bad in her life is because of me, I can guarantee you. I have messed her up. I'm serious. Yeah, right. I don't need an amen from, I don't need an amen from you, man. I'm just trying to tell you that, 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 yeah, that in our mind that we need tolerance. Uh, to show you this written down in the Bible, let me, let me turn back. If you look back on your page of Scripture passages, you will see uh, the passage in Luke 6. It says, Law 3, the law of tolerance. Look, it says Luke 6, verse 37, verse 41. Notice what it says. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. 
And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not discern the, the, discern the plank that's in your own eye? The board. The te- in other words, Jesus said, why are you trying to pick a speck out of somebody else's eye when you got a telephone pole in yours? <laughs> right. Yeah, you got a timber in your own eye. And I'm just saying that one of the laws of your mind is your, your mind has to be ready to experience the others in your life knowing that you're going to have to have tolerance because they are not perfect and they're going to deviate from the standard at some point, and so are you. So if you're expecting perfection out of others in life, you're going to be sorely disappointed and your relationships are going to be upside down because you don't have any tolerance. You, this is where I would say to you that, you know, uh, it may not lie, your, their life might not be plum, plum, but it's plum some. And sometimes plum some has to be good enough. Hey, I might not be plum plum, but I'm plum sum, and plum sum is better than I used to be, you know? Yeah. Now, hey, I'm headed toward trying to be purely plum, but until I get there, uh, will you accept the fact that I'm just moving in that direction? Can we have a little tolerance going on here? Because a lot of times we kill the people around us because we, we, want, we expect perfection out of them. And so what, 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 what would you do if God held you to that standard, you know? The, the, you're not perfect either. And God, God says, even though you're not perfect, I forgive you. And Jesus died because we are not perfect. And, and, and so we need to allow for imperfection in others in our life. Pray for them, encourage them, lift them. Uh, you know, the best way to do is, uh, it, here's the best thing to do in life, period. And this is just kind of like lanyard for you. Um, whatever you encourage persists. You know, whatever you criticize or whatever you don't notice seems to go away, you know, that goes the opposite way. If you want, I'm saying, if you want someone to change when they move toward the direction that you would like, uh, say something. Say, hey, man, I know you. Yeah, help them change. You know, hey, boy, that was great. I like that. I admire that. That was wonderful. Boy, that's the way, I'm glad you did that. That was smart. You know, just anything like that to tell them and encourage them that that's a good step to make right there. That's stepping more toward perfection. And, and they'll, you know, if they love you, they'll do it again. I don't know about, about you guys, and, but uh, I love Tanya. I always, you know, I have since we've been teenagers. We grew up together a lot, and we, for these 40 years, we've been married. Uh, if I find out something makes her happy, I love her. I want her to be happy. I'll do it again. I absolutely will. If she'll let me know that makes her happy, you can guarantee I'll do that again because that's what I want, and I want her to be happy and pleased. And so that's what I'm saying about tolerance. Just, uh, you know, speak toward the things that are great and move toward the things that are great, and and God will encourage it, and it'll it'll happen again. There's some good questions on on this one on your list. I don't know if you noticed that, but uh, but do that. All right, let's go on to law four. Law four is the law of respect. Um, Ephesians 5, that's the passage for this, and it's on on your sheet. It said, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, this, you'll see this more, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about the laws, of your, the laws of your marriage or relationships, because this is a really, really, really big deal, I'm telling you. But in connection with this passage, the law of respect, uh, what, I, what I'd like to, to point out here is that it's easy to lose respect for the people that you're close to. The reason why is because you know everything about them. You know, you, everybody else in the world may think they're a 10, but you know they're a 1. <laughs> and so it's mighty easy for you <laughs> to think and to disrespect them because you are very close to them and you know everything about them. You know the only perfect people in life? The people we don't know. The people that we watch on TV, you know, the TV preachers as an example, 
Those guys are perfect. They're great. Oh, my Lord, they are wonderful. That's because you don't know them. They have some warts and blemishes and junk like that. If you were around a lot of them, you'd be going, oh, my Lord, that in the world, how in the world. That? But, but you disrespect the one, people that you're around because you know too much about them, and then you, you know, respect others that you have nothing. And I'm just saying that that kind of evaluation comes from our mind and how we're set up to, to, to think about, um, about others. We are to treat e- each other with love and, and respect, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a mentality. You know, there's an old saying that familiarity brings, uh, what, uh, contempt. Well, yeah, it breeds contempt. Well, familiarity also breeds complacency also, um, where we lose focus, where we don't think about the fact that we need to be respectful to each other. And the closer you are and the longer you've been with somebody, the less respect because familiarity not only breeds contempt, it also breeds complacency. You quit doing respectful things. Like, when's the last time you opened the car door for your wife, man? Well, um, back in 1977, wasn't it? <laughs> 77. Well... Uh, and, and, like, and again, I'm using myself, and I'm, you know, I don't know you, so I'm just having to use myself. But I told Tanya this when we got married, or really when we started dating. I said, the first time she got in the car with me when we were dating, I went around to open the door, and she just went ahead and opened the door and got in. And so I'm, I'm about halfway around the car, so then I have to go back. And then when I got in, and, this, and I looked at her, and here's what I said. I said, if you will allow me to do this, I'll open this car door for you each time you get in. And so the next time she stood there and I went around and opened the door for her and she got in. And right now, uh, I do the same thing. Why? Because I love her, I respect her, and I think she deserves that kind of respect. Whenever we go into a store or whatever, and if it doesn't automatically open, I run up there and open the door for her because it's a respectful thing. I respect you this way. You know, so, so I'm just saying that don't let life and the familiarity that you have with the people around you uh, lull you to sleep so that you don't show respect for each other because the scripture says that that's a a, a very important thing in your life. And and on Saturday, when you walk through the the family room and TV's on a ball game up there and Mr. Wonderful's laying on the couch with a half-eaten bag of pig skin (laughs) on his chest, and a half drank milkshake on the floor, and his stomach hanging over the edge of the couch, and he's, he's watching the ball game through his eyelids, and, and you walk by, and everything within you says, disrespect, 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 and the devil says, look at that bird there. Can you believe you married somebody like that? Good night. What were you thinking? I'm just telling you, just walk right over there to him, gently pat him a little bit, and say, thank you, Lord, for my man right here. Yeah. <laughs> I Respect. And just think, I mean, when your children, they're not road scholars, they're not professional athletes, they're not on some who's who list somewhere, but think about this. What would you do without them? How would you feel without those respect starts right here in your mind? And, 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 and people know when they're not being respected. You know when you're not being respected. You know when people look at you, whether they respect you or not. And I, as your pastor, I hope that you sense, like for me, that I respect you. I try to be respectful because I do respect you, and you're all different. You're, all of you are. And I want to bring forth the fact that, hey, I'm telling you, I think you're great. You may not be plum plum, but hey, 
I, that's right. You plum some. Right. I know, man, I'm not plum plum either, you know. <laughs> but but we all plum some with the Lord, and I respect that, and I respect you. And, and we're not going to let familiarity make us uh, convey disrespect to each other. So the law of respect starts right here in your mind. All right, let's look at this fifth one. We got four minutes. Can he do it? Can he do it? Law five is the law of freedom. The law of freedom just basically says that your bad habits affect everybody around you. Um, that when you are in bondage, that God created you to be free. As a matter of fact, look, look at, at, at your passage in Galatians. Let's see. Let's go back here. Galatians 5, 13. Look on your scripture sheet. It's the last one on there. It's on page 2, the back side of that. Galatians 5, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Say, I'm free. All right, so you're called to be free. So, brethren, you have been called to liberty, to be free. Only don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So uh, God says, look, you have liberties. By liberties, it means there are certain things that you can do. You are, you are, are free to do these things. And if you want to know what this is talking about, go to the book of 1 Corinthians, start in chapter 8, and listen to what Paul says about what you have the privileges to do. There are a lot of things that I don't do, there are a lot of things I don't do in front of you because even though I might be free to do those things and have liberty because they are nothing to me, it might offend you. And you might be weakened by the fact that I'm, my liberty has said certain things to you because you don't have the same point of view or your maturity level is different. Paul in Corinthians talks about eating meat and not eating meat as an example because some of the people he was trying to minister to in the church had just come out of paganism, and these pagans took sacrifices and offered them to idols and then took the meat that was left and took it down to their local supermarket because it was a good piece of meat and sold it to the supermarket, and the supermarket would sell it to people at a reduced price and Paul said, I like, I like that meat. That meat's nothing to me. That, I know that meat doesn't have a curse on it. That meat's not carrying some evil idol inside of it. But some of you who have just come out of paganism, you think that's a big deal. You think that meat's curse. You think that meat is, is like an idol, and so you're going to stay away. No, 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 no. That's demonism. That's ugly. And so the Apostle Paul says, even though I know that meat is nothing, and it could be eaten and enjoyed because it's good meat, and it's at a cheap price, <laughs> and I go down and, and I'll order it at my local restaurant because it means nothing to me. I'm saying you are crazy for believing that. That means nothing. The meat's not cursed or anything because some of you don't have that same point of view because you are tender about this. You're very, you know, you're weak toward this. I'm not going to eat meat in front of you. I might eat it back here because I know it doesn't mean anything, but in front of you, I'm not going to weaken you because of my liberty, because of my point of view and my thought. So because of I respect you, because I want to be a good example to you, and I don't want to be a negative in your life. I don't want to open up something in your life that might harm you along the way or weaken you along the way because God's going to hold me responsible for being a good example and not doing things that hurt you. I'm not going to eat meat. So if it offends my brother, I'm not going to do it. You know, even though I have the liberty to do it. I'm going to do it. What? What? Bacon. <laughs> hey, I'm going to tell you what. God loves bacon. And it would never be bacon. I can tell you that. He created bacon so we could go to heaven when we die. That's exactly what he did. Bacon is the food of life. <laughs> There's going to be some part of bacon in the river of life. All I'm going to tell you. If you don't like it, man, make it, make it better. You know, you can hate things. You don't, you don't like potatoes and stuff like that? Sprinkle a little bacon on it, boom, you got an entree. I mean, it's not even, oh, just cover it with bacon. Have you noticed this really? Whenever you want to make something taste better, what do they do? Put bacon on it. Wrap it in bacon. Boy, it's made. All right, anyway, it's time. <laughs> so anyway. 
But that's the law of freedom. And the law of freedom just basically says, if I have been set free, then everybody around me is set free. If I'm still in bondage, then everybody around me is hooked to my bondage. If I'm late for everything and I never show up on time, I can't look at the people around me who are dependent on me and I look at them and say, you know, hey, I can, I can do whatever I want to. I'm going, yeah, but we're all riding with you. We can't leave until you leave. So your lateness and your propensity to not care about time and be tardy on everything not only affects you, but everybody riding with you, you know? It's just a fact that... Uh, if you're free, if you're set free, then people around you are set free. If you're held in bondage, if you're an alcoholic, if you're a drug addict, if you're a wife beater, if you're a negative person, if you whatever, just name it. If you're in bondage of any kind, you are not by yourself. The people that are dependent on you, the people that love you, the people that are around you, the people that believe in you, they're also in bondage. So get free. Get free. The law of freedom says he who, who the son sets free is free indeed. And ask the Lord to set you free and ask the Lord to work in your life that freedom might come in and that you might be convicted of whatever it is that's holding you in bondage and holding everybody around you in bondage because God intends for your life to be free so that you can not only be free, but everybody around you can be free. And it starts right here in your mind that God can set me free. All right? All right. Y'all got any questions about this? I know I kind of went through some of it hurriedly. But that's five of the laws or five more of them. That's the top five right there. What is the first one? Because it's the most important of all, the law of a servant. That life is not all about me. Just remember that. Life's not all about me. So every one of these rules have to do with the fact that life is not all about me. Life is about what Christ can do through me. Life is about what I can be, what I can become, what God intends for me to become what I can be, taking my life to the cross, putting my life on the cross like Jesus put himself on the cross so that all of us can be free, all of us can be affected. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who died on a cross, not for himself, but for us, because life's not all about us. So see, that's, that's how it starts, okay? Now, is that pretty clear and good, or y'all need a little more of that, or what? Okay, I have a propensity to just kind of beat the horse to death, so y'all just have to, y'all have to forgive me for that, all right? Because I'm not plum plum. I'm, I'm still working on it. You'd, you'd think after forty something years I ought to be plum plum, but I'm, I'm still affected by that. Still, yeah, I'm half bubble. Yeah. <laughs> I used to be two and a half bubble. Now I'm just half bubble. I'm working on it. All right, let's have a word of prayer, guys. Y'all, y'all stand your.